Hey, everybody. We're trying a new experiment tonight. I got two things going, but um, if you're watching us on Facebook or Instagram here, um, welcome to our live event tonight. Um, and we got a great show tonight. Um, our guest, if you don't already know, um, he is an amazing Gosh, he, he, I think, I think he just, I think he does it all. Um, but tonight, um, I'm just going to wait for it to come up over here on, uh, Instagram. Actually, let me just see if I can pull him up over here on Instagram. Give me one second. Um, Paul Rugg. Cool. Um, yeah, well, you heard me say his name already. Uh oh, you must upgrade. Oh, oh. uh oh. Wave. Okay. And go live. Uh oh. Well, I'm going to tell him I'm here. <laughs> Uh oh, we had a problem, but not a problem. It says you need oh, to upgrade. You need, you need to upgrade your app to join us on Instagram. Uh oh, no worries though. Oh, oh well, I don't see. <laughs> I knew something terrible would happen. Oh well. And this is what it is. <laughs> no worries. Let me just get to tell everybody on Instagram. If you're watching us here, go over to the Facebook page in Credicon <laughs> HV, or go over and look at Incredicon HV on YouTube. That's where we are. We'll see you all later on there. But we're back here live on Facebook and YouTube. Anyways, Paul Rugg, you you are the man. You do it all. That's why I'm happy to have you here tonight. Why? Okay, um, good. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> um, I mean, geez, I you know, and there's there there are so many people like you out there. Um, but you really are like the the childhood of like a generation. You, you, <laughs> oh wow! Thank you. You you you, were, you worked on so on so many great projects. Um, animation wise, puppetry wise, you know. Um. So I guess tell us a little bit. How did you get started in the world of animation? Where 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 would where did you first begin? Uh, so I was with a uh, uh, a sketch comedy troupe in um, uh, Los Angeles called the Acme Comedy Players, which is sort of an offshoot. There were some Groundlings people that left the Groundlings, and um, Sherry Stoner. Uh, who was the story editor on um, Tiny Toons and then Animaniacs, um, her husband sort of started it. So I was one of the first people in there. John McCann, who we uh, wrote um, Freakazoid with me, he was on it. And Adam Carolla uh, oh, was one, one of our members. In fact, Adam, um, when I first started, I just gotten married. I didn't have a job uh, because I was an actor and, you know, waiting around. So I would work with Adam Adam was a carpenter, so I would go, so be between shows, I would go and help him build cabinets and stuff. But, um, <laughs> uh, so we were doing that and having a great time. And then when they were thinking about Animaniacs, they realized that they really wanted a sketch comedy vibe to it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they approached uh, me and John McCann uh, and wanted to know whether they could give us a sample script. And I was like having nothing, you know, we were like eating a lot of top ramen at the time. And I think my wife was a social worker and, and we had nothing. Um, uh, I wrote one uh, for Animaniacs. I, my sample script was, I believe, Beethoven, Roll Over Beethoven. And John McCann's was um, uh, Dracula, Dracula. So we, we, we wrote those over a week and it was really hard because at that time, um, and it was kind of ex exciting. The, the way you would write an animated script for Warner Brothers anyway in those days was you would call the angles. You would say angle on, scratch and sniff, camera follows, picks up, and you would say everything. So you would almost direct as you were writing. And uh, Sherry Stoner sent some, spent some time with me, and I was like, I'm never going to get this, you know. And I remember, I remember in writing that, that script, I think I spent an entire day with them at a door like say so i was like where does the kid where should the camera be for them to enter the door uh and that's something 30 years later i still have problems with doors and where the camera should be but anyway um so i turned that in and uh john mccann turned his in and i thought well that was fun that's nothing's gonna come of that and uh, then about an hour later after we turned them in we got i got a call and so so did john wouldn't know if he wanted to join the staff um and that was basically it. And uh, um, it was great. Animaniacs was, you know, <laughs> as, as far as like first jobs, it was like the perfect first job because it was, it was um, 
uh, obviously wasn't known. So we were just having fun and um, just going to the office, running around the hallways, uh, making each other laugh. And um, it was awesome. So that's basically my incredibly long involved story that included a story about a door, by the way. So I like to, I like to do a lot of door stories. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so that's how I got, that's how I got started. I was never really like, I love Bugs Bunny. I loved Looney Tunes. I loved all that stuff, but I never thought about it as, as a potential career yeah. at all. It was like not on my radar. I mean, cause I mean, certainly, I, and I'm going to get, I'm going to just take a guess here. Was that phone call that you got? Was that from Tom Ruger? Yes. <laughs> and Tom, well, Tom no, yeah, I, I, actually there was a, it was kind of a, it was kind of a joke uh, that um, they, they played on me. So Sherry Stoner and Tom Ruger were in their office. John McCann, after we delivered our scripts, John came over to my house uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, and we, because we both promised each other, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll both finish these scripts and then all we could afford were powdered donuts. And so we, we both agreed we would get powdered donuts and watch the worst science fiction movie we could find. Um, and it escapes me what it was, but it did not, it did, it did not disappoint. And halfway through that movie, it was like 11 o'clock in the morning on a Friday, two yeah. bums just sit, sitting around. Um, we got a call from Sherry mm -hmm. and Sherry, she answered the, uh, I answered the phone and she said, John. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, great, great, great. So I gave the phone to John and she, and she told John that he just got a job at Animaniacs. And then he goes, yeah, okay. And then he handed the phone back to me and I was like, okay, well, goodbye. And she let that go on a while. Like, okay, okay well, we'll see you. And they said, oh, by the way, you have a job too. But anyway, yeah. So that was it. Well, because I mean, like, and again, like you mentioned, Sherry Stoner, we talked about Tom Ruger, like there, there was such an, and I guess you already said it too, there, there's a playfulness to the production there. I mean, yeah. and, and just such a talent, talented group of people, both, you know, writing and animating, creating the show, and then the voice actors, like just across the board, like, yeah. like, you know, when I guess... And people look at this now, like, and if you look at that 90s period of animation that really did come from Warner Brothers, Freakazoid, Animaniacs, Tiny Toons. I mean, even throw in there like Batman and stuff like that. Like they they were quite the powerhouse for quite quite a while there. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all, although it's like, I was talking about with this with my wife the other day. Our, our offices were about as normal as one could have, right? So there was there was no indication that what we were doing there was like, magical and happy it was this it was we were on the i think eighth 11th and fifth floor of this office building with you yeah. know cubicles and it, it looked like we were selling insurance um <laughs> and and there was something and also our building at that time it was the imperial bank building at the sherman oaks galleria mm -hmm. and um so what we would do during lunch we would go down to the to the mall and just and, and wander out and it was now that I think about it, it was probably the perfect place to write Animaniacs because we would go down from our offices into pop culture, like just to be infused at that mall in everything going on. Um, and that's a famous mall. It's not even there and, anymore. Uh, uh, but that's where the Valley Girl used to come from. And oh. um, yeah, so yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions already coming in here um, from cool. some people. Um, I'm going to just go with um, our, our, and this is Sir Jane. He's one of our our regular viewers here. He's a big voice actor friend. Was Don Messick ever in Freakazoid? I don't. Was uh, yes, yes, Don Messick was. Don, uh, we did a parody of Johnny Quest. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, oh my, Toby, Toby, Toby. Danger. So uh, Don Messick came in, and um, it, it, he he just nailed that whole vibe and um and to be honest with with you and this is kind of embarrassing but i didn't really know who don messick was um but everyone else in the you know in the animation they they knew who don messick was and i was like well and they treated him like you know yo sir and then i was like well who's don messick though he was the voice of everything you've ever and then when they told me i was like yeah well um let me ask you voice actor wise because again um 
these these shows. I mean, I mean, let's start with Freakazoid. You worked with Ed Asner. Everybody loves Ed yeah. Asner. Um, yes. Like, like, did you ha were there outside of Don Messick? Um, were there any voice actors that you you were ha you were like either I guess um, surprised to to work with or like you know just like like uh, wow. I'm yeah, well, so again, Legends. I didn't, I didn't really know who anybody was, right? Because I was, uh, and then I slowly got introduced to, um, you know, obviously Rob Paulson, um, Jess Harnell, Tress mm -hmm. McNeil, and and then people like Frank Welker, yeah. who you know, obviously the voices Scoop Scooby Doo, and and Frank was cast as uh, a bunch of different characters in Animaniacs. He was Thaddeus Plotz, he yep. was Ralph Ralph the Guard, and um, just watching these, I mean, and Frank is probably the most seasoned professional, and watching him work uh, was absolutely amazing. In fact, uh, a couple years ago, maybe eight years ago, um, I did a couple uh, Scooby Doo's for. Um, uh, Scooby Doo Mystery, Mystery Incorporated, and uh, I had I had written a couple, and I did a couple voices on it, and I would usually sit next to Frank. So you know, you're just sort of sitting there in this in this arch, mm -hmm. and it was amazing because so Frank had Frank's a pilot, and he had like Pilots Magazine or Pilot Magazine. So Frank would be at his podium, and the whole you know everybody would be doing their lines, and Frank would be reading his you know, reading his pilot magazine like this. And then without without missing a beat, as everyone's doing their lines, when it came time to Scooby, it would be literally like this. It'd be like, you know, yeah, bah, 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 and Frank would be reading and then go, <laughs> and he would just, he'd like, as, as if it was hardwired in into his brain. And um, he's the only person I've ever known that just has such confidence that he's like, yeah, I got you. I'm just gonna, um, so that always, uh, um, amazed me. Um, Freakazoid, we got to work with a bunch of like actors, yeah. like uh, uh, Tim Curry and David Warner, who uh, was the Lobe, Ed Asner, um, Ed, uh, just some incredible people came came by there. And um, one of my favorite stories, and we had Jonathan Harris, who's Doctor yeah. Smith. But my favorite thing was normally the way Andrea Romano, the world's best, most amazing voice director, worked is absolutely. Um, she would make sure everybody got there about a half hour early, and then on Freakazoid anyway. John McCann and I uh, loved pizza, so we would make sure that there was Baroni's Pizza, which is a special pizza, and all the actors would come in, and we would all sit, you know, at the lunch table there, and everyone would just sort of shoot the breeze for like 20 minutes as they ate their pizza. David Warner would sometimes get there late because he was shooting Titanic wherever he was doing it. And Jonathan Harris would be there. And I think my favorite time was we had Tim Curry, Jonathan Harris, oh my gosh. Leonard, Leonard Malton, um, obviously Ed Asner. And they're all just sitting around this table eating pizza. And, <laughs> um, and then we went in the booth uh, to record and they don't really do it this way and anymore because I don't know why, but Andre was pretty dead set on the whole cast would be there. Everybody would be there. So we would all sit in the, in this semicircle and we would run it once without the mics rolling. We would just literally rehearse the scene. And then, you know, Ed Asner would get an idea and, and he would he would get a laugh. And so and then w once we ran through it, we'd talk about it a little bit and then we would just go and we wouldn't stop unless somebody made a mistake. Right. Uh, we would just go from line to line to line to line to line to line. And sometimes we get through an entire act. We'd stop. And then um, you know, Andre would talk to us and be like, is there anything you guys want to try differently? And sometimes we would say, yeah, let's try this line di differently. But the way we did Freakazoid a lot was, and the way we did Animaniacs a lot back then was as a radio play. We just, we just went. Well, you know, I was just going to mention it because we had Bob Bergen on a couple of weeks ago. And, and we were talking about that same exact thing because a lot of these people, like we mentioned in Don Messick, but you go back to like Don Messick, Mel Blanc, June Frey, like a lot of those of those original voice actors, they all came from the world of radio initially. Right, yeah, right. 
Right. So when they were, when they, when you look back at those old cartoons, you know, the, the, the Hanna-Barbera stuff, especially the Hanna-Barbera stuff in the sixties, even up until the nineties, like you were saying, you know, it was done like a radio play. Yeah. And, and there's something, um, there's a, there's an energy to be, to be gotten with it. And, uh, I did Puss in Boots with uh, Eric Bauza, uh, and we did it that way a little bit, but, but, um, you know, voice actors normally are now, okay, you come in, you sit down, you do all of your lines. And w when it's just you individually, uh, you know, you, you do a line three times with a different little thing, but you're not really feeding off of what somebody just, just said. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it, kill, it kills, it kills that, uh, that real personalization, the improv. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, just, just like in a live action show, you see how actors play with one another you know, right. or stage. And I'm sure same thing in animation. Like if you're seeing two actors as these characters vibing, just goofing around, improving, like mm -hmm. the wife might be like, wow, that what an idea that is. And yeah. like you said, doing it, especially now in the times that we're in now, everybody's doing these recordings at home. Right, right, right. You kind of lose lose that little um, little um, element, element there. Um, we have a couple of other questions now coming in. Yeah. Um, we go what we got here. Um, so from Colin Pittman, Paul, uh, he says, hi, Paul. My favorite characters of yours are Freakazoid as well as Nostradamus and Montezuma from Hysteria. And again, another great show, Hysteria, geez. Yeah. Um, and uh, we got another question here from uh, Sarah Jane. Um, he's well, thank like, you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, what was it like working with Tom Wilson on Pig, Goat, Banana, Cricket? So Tom, uh, I didn't know Tom at all. And now Tom are like, and I are like best friends. So um, Tom is Tom Wilson. So here's something, because everybody, you know, thinks Biff and the bully and all that stuff. I kid, I kid you not. In fact, I'm going to get close to my camera here. Tom is the smartest person I've ever met in my life. All right. Um, we're both ca Catholic and stuff. And Tom, he could tell you about the church fathers of 2000 years ago and like facts and dates and all that stuff. And I was like, this is a very smart person. And um, and so uh, Tom was so much fun to work with because when he did banana, um, you know, Tom's sort of a big guy. He just he just would like, like he was this force to be re reckoned with. Um, Tom is like one of the most versatile, amazing actors ever, ever. So big thumbs up to Tom Wilson. He's an awesome, awesome guy. Um, now let me, let me ask you this question. Um, so, and cause, cause it's going to lead into what something else that came up. So you were doing all this animation. You, you started off doing this, the, the comedy with the Acme comedy group, um, mm -hmm. now transferring onto animation. How did you get into puppetry? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I it all. <laughs> yeah, when uh, after Freakazoid sort of got you know, canned or canceled, um, I was like, oh, that's kind of disappointing because that was a lot of fun. Uh, Gene McCurdy, president of Warner Brothers Animation, said, why don't you stick around and, and why don't you develop something? So uh, John McCann and I and Doug Langdale, um, we developed the Daffy Duck primetime show, which was basically sort of like Larry Sanders, like Daffy Duck has a show and it's a show within a show. We had a great time doing it. That sounds we great. Had, yeah, we had a huge pitch at Warner Brothers. Um, we had all the executives there. We had rehearsed this thing and all this stuff. And it was, uh, in, in fact, hold on one sec. Hold on. I think uh -oh. I have it here. Hold on. Hold no. on. I found this. I found this the other day because I'm going through all of my old storage stuff. Um, this is the some artwork for the pitch. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you the whole screen too, so people right. can see it. There you go. So this is uh, this is some artwork <laughs> uh, that that we had, and it's just sort of like, and this is actually painted by Spike Brandt um, wow. and Tony Servone. So anyway, it was Daffy doing parodies, doing all this crazy stuff, and. Um, we had the people at Warner Brothers, like in our pocket, we had the president of the company going, this is great, I love this. And then the president of um, the WB, a guy named Jamie Kellner. Yes. Um, he, he was sitting in the front. So we had all these Warner Brothers people, just like the executive synergy, and this is great. And, and Jamie Kellner uh, stood up 
And I remember he sucked the air out, out of the room by saying something like, uh, this is really not what we're interested in. And energy turned on, it was like, and we were done. So that was like, uh, so then I was like, okay, I, I really got to find something else. Uh, so I had heard that Henson, this is a very long answer to start, but I heard that Henson, the Jim Henson company was looking for pitches. So I met with Alex Rockwell and Hallie Sanford and I pitched them this idea and they were like, great, write it. So I wrote this thing it was called Robot Dog, um, which was a, a, a very silly thing. And based on that, they really, they really liked it. In fact, we had sold it once to Disney and then something happened and we didn't sell it. Uh, but, but by the way, the story of like, things crumbling, it's just, it's, you know, it's just common, right? Mm -hmm. um, but based on that, when Brian Henson, he sort of felt that the puppeteers, that this, a bit of um, an improv spark, a bit of spontaneity had been lost. Um, and like puppeteers, when they didn't have a script in front of them would falter. And, and so he was like, man, his dad was all about spontaneity. Yeah. So Brian was like, he really wanted to infuse in his puppeteers that spark of whatever you're going to do. Right. Yeah. So there, that's, that's, that's Brian there in the, yeah. in the middle. So, um, he decided to form an Im improv group and I guess they had been going a couple weeks and Hallie Sanford called me and said, Hey, why don't you go, uh, to one of their rehearsals. They do it Wednesday nights. It's in the Charlie Chaplin Theater. We have 80 puppets, and it's Brian, and it's Patrick Bristow, who's uh, a director at the Groundlings. And why don't you just go, and Brian would like to meet you. And I'd never met Brian. So fine, I show up, um, and I didn't really know what this, uh, you know, Brian met me. He goes, hi, Paul, nice to meet you. You know, Patrick met me, hi, meet you. And I went in the room, in the screening room, uh, which was our little makeshift uh, stage. And I'm with Bill Beretta, Alan Troutman, Drew Massey, Victor. Um, Yared. Yeah, yeah. Vic Victor Yared. All these, like, the puppeteers of, like, puppeteer. Um, yeah. Like, the world's best pup puppeteers. And... Patrick ran it like an imp improv group. It's like, okay, Drew, uh, Victor, and I got them mixed up always. I would call Victor, Drew, and Drew, Victor. But anyway, you get up there, grab two puppets, and could we have a location? Um, city dump, whatever. And, you know, they would just put their hands up into the screen of the, we had a camera, and they would do a scene. Yeah. So imagine there, now you've got a camera there. And, um, and I was like sitting in the back going, oh, my gosh, they're not going to call on me, right? They're not going <laughs> to. There's no way they're gonna have me, cause I don't. I'm not. What am I doing here? And the next thing I know, Patrick says, "Okay, Paul, why don't you get up there?" And um, and I was like, "I don't. I don't no idea how to do any of this." So, uh, I think Drew said, "Why don't you grab that penguin?" And it was just a penguin, and it was you put your hand in and you do that. And I was like, "Okay, fine." And I had no idea how to put my hand. It was to the side. Um, I was petrified and I think I got, uh, they wanted me to do a, a guy that had seen something unusual. So I believe mine was, uh, you just saw like a demon born or something. And I forget, I forget what it was, uh, but it went really well and I had a great time. And then, um, in fact, Brian, uh, has since told me that uh, I wasn't supposed to get up there to pu puppeteer. I was just there as a writer to sort of suggest ideas. Uh, but the next thing you know, um, I, he invited me back and I kept coming back. And the next thing you know, I was a part of the pu puppet up. But I can't tell you how many times I'd be up there and either Drew or Victor or Alan Trampman would come and, you know, place my hand and be like, you know, because these are, you know, when they see something that's not great. Um, yeah, yeah, but anyway, that's how I got my start. That's another long story. No, but that's no, but it. So you kind, you kind of, of like fell into it. it. 
Obviously. Yeah, I did. I did. I, I, again, and puppets. I loved the Muppet Show, but I wasn't like, like I was with people that like from the d day of they were b being born, they liked like puppets and stuff. So, um, and I didn't know. I didn't. I yeah, I didn't know anything. So, but anyway, <laughs> well, but and and these are all people now. Um, Drew Massey, uh, Alan Troutman, um, who I just I think they're like the most phenomenal actors ever. Like better than actor or actors well again and and i mean you 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 experienced it yourself too i mean because you're not just using your voice you're using your whole right yeah your whole body and it it's it it, it it's almost like watching like uh I, I don't even know what kind of art you can compare to just because the way that they all move and and again you know this from puppet up you're everybody's crunched up together yeah. You, you better be wearing deodorant or be very comfortable yeah. with your friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was, there was a, there was a lot of washing going on. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, we have a couple more people. We have uh, Matt Casper. He says hello, Mr. Rug, longtime Freakazoid fan here. Matt, oh, um, and, and Matt, Matt, actually, I know he's a, he's a local artist here. Okay. Matt, if you get um, shoot up, shoot me a message because I can show Paul. Matt made a Freakazoid figure. Um. So if you want to if you want to shoot that out to me, Matt, um, send it over one of the messengers yeah, here. I'll, see, I will, yeah. I'll share that out there for everybody to see. Um, so we have that. Um, but we have going back to the Henson thing. Um, Jane Bauer, she's one of your biggest fans from Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Bauer, hi Jane. Do you know? Do you know Jane? I know Jane. I know oh. Jane. Jane. <laughs> Jane. I know Jane. 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 By the way is is a a world-renowned news anchor okay um, oh she she was with kfwb and then they decided to leave los angeles and become even fa more famous in in michigan so there you go nice. nice well thank you for joining us jane but she asks a good question how are you selected to be the star of ned and earth to ned because i mean that show has kind of like taken disney plus by storm i mean I mean, what better time to have a show come on than during a pandemic when everybody's yeah, doing yeah, yeah. TV. But how did you get that role? Uh, well, they um, I got a call from uh, Gigi uh, Jabawi, Babawi, uh, who's Brian Henson's um, assistant. And in this case, she was like a producer on Ned when they were just think, thinking about it. And she said, hey, I think I have something that you might like because she knows I'm like, I, I'm kind of picky and I normally, I would rather pet the dog than actually go work. So um, I was like, well, yeah, what, what is it? She's like, I can't tell you anything about it. I, I can just say that um, I'm gonna send you a document. I want you to look at it. And uh, I want you to maybe think about doing, you know, maybe auditioning. So I said, okay, Gigi. So she sent me this, I, this document and it was about Ned and this alien. And she said, um, you know, we're reaching out to a bunch of different pe people, but why don't you think about this guy? And they had some stuff written. Um, and so I thought about it. And um, so then I went to the first auditions and they had this, uh, geez, I don't even think then. No, they didn't even have a head. Um, mm -hmm. It was, they brought a bunch of puppeteers in and they just had a sort of go back and forth interviewing the other puppeteer. And, um, and by the, at that time, Ned's voice was, I was doing some Eastern European thing. Like I, I, there was like, I knew the voice was key and I couldn't find it. And I remember in the audition, I slipped in and out of this voice more times than I can tell you. And it was, I thought, a disaster. I was like, oh, man, I'm never going to hear from them again. That didn't go well. Um, but then I got a call back. Um, and uh, they said, um, uh, we're going to, let's go to the next level. So they built this big foam head. Hmm. And the idea was to put your hand in this big foam head. And then they had a, a Cornelius kind of a big foam Cornelius and they just tried us out, you know, doing a bunch of di different stuff. And part of this audition process, which was really interesting and I thought it would be really intimidating was the people that you're sort of competing against um, are actually sitting there watching you do it. So I think Drew Massey was in the, 
was in the room when I did it and, and Victor or, or I can't remember who, but, but you basically, you would sit and watch your competition audition yeah. in front, in front of you. And I've now come to see that as an awesome thing because, um, and especially the way Hanson does it. Hanson's a family, right? So they, uh, it's everybody wants the best person to win and or to get this this job because ch- chances are if you didn't get that you'll get this other thing or and um and yeah. it it was it was so collegiate and um and it was cool and then all of a sudden next thing you know people are you know people are suggesting hey why don't you try it like this and trying it like like that so anyway that's how it happened and then it got whittled down and got whittled down got whittled down and um and then michael ostrom and i who's brilliant as cornelius I guess we just had a really good chemistry, and um, and and Mike Michael Ostrom is just awesome because he was channeling this whole yeah whatever. Um, <laughs> he channeled this just you you can see you can tell that this guy Cornelius has a bit of loathing for Ned, but but he brings it out in this great way. Anyway, um, that's how I got it. That's how, and and it was months. It was. It was at least two months of going in, waiting, hearing. And then when I finally found out, uh, I remember I got a call from Brian and he said, hey, you know, I just want to let you know you're going to we want you to be Ned. And I said, oh, Brian, thanks. And then Brian said something. Well, he said, "Um, now, listen, this is the most complex animatronic head we've ever made. What? And we're giving it to you. I'm nervous about that. Like, meaning, I don't think you're capable, or not capable. But he, he mentioned to me like, this is gonna, you're gonna have to practice really, 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 really hard. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. Well, that's why I'm, I'm just gonna pull a picture up of Ned again too. Um, yeah. Right. So, 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 how many people? Because I know you, I saw a video that you posted, I guess, um, of from behind the scenes. Yeah. I, you're obviously you're the voice you're puppeteering um how is how is ned functioning because there's a lot going on um golly there's no way i can share anything is there or well Um, well all right so i'll uh i'll i'll tell you i am only doing the mouth okay so meaning i have i have this this gimbal this this glove that's on this the Waldo thing, right? Yeah, the Waldo. Turn it this way, turn it that way. Uh, this here, I'll go like this. This is sort of talking, but if I move it like this or like this, that'll increase the smile or decrease the smile. Uh, it'll make O shapes. So if I move this finger down, it'll 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 bring things in. If I move this finger, you can program it any different any different way. So. Um, so I'm doing that. I'm doing Ned's mouth. Next to me is Alan Troutman. Uh, and Alan is doing probably the most important thing, which is our Ned's eyes. So mm-hmm. Alan has, and he's right next to me, so he sort of can hear where I'm going. And he's controlling the eyes, the blinks, but he's also um, adding smiles and frowns because... Well, I'll just go through what everybody's doing. Then um, inside the body is Morgana and sort of moving the body, which becomes very important because Ned is so excited that so moving it like this, moving it like this, moving, moving forward um, on the two front hands is Donna, Donna Kimball. And um uh, she's, you know, doing the more textury sort of grabbing things and stuff. And so she's down in the pit and she's doing the two front front hands. We have Jack Venturo, Raymond Carr. Uh, oftentimes they were doing uh, just a hand each in, in the back, a left hand and a right hand. So that's, let me see, that's me, that's Alan, that's Morgana, that's Jack. I'm forgetting someone. Yeah, Jack, Raymond, and Donna. That's six of us operating this one puppet in real time. Um, well, that's what I was gonna say. Like rehearsal-wise, and like you're saying, real time. Like, 
how how difficult or i mean do you guys have you have you fallen into a rhythm now that you've been doing it for for a, 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 a quite a bit now well like, yeah so can, when we when we first uh when uh so about a month and a half before we were going to start filming um we all were put up at the creature shop uh, and um so the jim henson creature shop that's where they've got decades of amazing things and stuff and they were still building ned's head but they had sort of a they had sort of a, a a temporary latex sort of face around it. So Ned's head has, I think Brian told me once, like thirty or forty servos, motors uh, that that are basically moving that skin, those lips, the tongue, um, and um, so when we first got there, none of that stuff worked. Like I mean, and be, because it's trial and error and stuff, and you know. And it took a long time to program that this opens the mouth and everything. So we did like two weeks of that sort of drilling. I remember Drew Massey would drill us on, you know, A-E-I-O-U, 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 bringing lips together, making them go. Um, and there would be hours of just drilling the mouth. Then they put the head on the body. They got Morgana in there, and uh, we started to try to, you know, put hands in front. And the first time we did it, <laughs> it was like, this is never going to work. Like, <laughs> uh, and Brian uh, even admitted, I think he's admitted in interviews, he was like, he didn't know if, if it was going to work. That the Henson Company has uh, a habit of promising yeah. things that they don't know if it's going to work, but they're pretty sure they're going to make it work. And, and Ned sort of fell in that, in that, in that realm. So anyway, then we rehearsed for about another week uh, in the body and, you know, trying to get it to work and trying to bring it all together. And we would read scripts and, and we never really like the scripts were really good, but we never like could communicate with each other in reading scripts. So then we just started improvising. Mm -hmm. And then after improv improvising, everybody just sort of got a sense who Ned was. And by the time we showed up on set after that month, month and a half, um, it started working. And we rarely like uh, we rarely communicated while we were doing it. Some sometimes Alan, who isn't talking, he would have a little microphone and he'd be like, all right, get ready to rear back or something. But that hardly ever, ever yeah ever happened um but when i'm doing that i'm sometimes uh when especially when we're interviewing a, a guest we would have sort of a general idea of where the questions were going but not you know so i would ask the question but the guest might say something that took us off in a diff different direction so sometimes we would talk uh, about that so i had the producer in my ear talking to me uh i had the guest talking to me I'm doing this. And sometimes I thought I was landing at 747 because I was like, you know, there's just too much going, going on here. But after a while, it all just was pretty smooth. Well, let me ask you too, especially like you're mentioning working with the guests. I mean, you know, and there's been a lot, obviously it's on Disney plus and it's a collaboration with Disney and Henson, you know, so th there were a lot of comparisons to the Muppet show, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously a character like Ned is a lot different than like Kermit. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, you got one, one maybe at times, depending on the body movements of Kermit, maybe two people work in Kermit, whereas Ned, you got this whole team. Like, was has there been a time where, like, a guest really has, like, thrown it off into, like... Um, no, you know, to be honest with, with, with you, um... So when, uh, when we found this in our first few that we did, um, and we eventually developed a formula, but sometimes when that guest is brought in, um, and we film on the chaplain stage, so it's a, yeah. it's a huge stage, and you know the set is built up, and the guest sort of walks in, and then they're confronted with Ned, right, who's seven feet tall, and this weird set, and um, they would meet us, the puppeteers. 
we'd say, hey, very nice to meet you, whatever. And then they'd sit down. We'd say, okay, let's do this. And we would all go to our places. I was about 20 feet away with Alan. Yeah. We're not right there with Ned. He's connected by wireless and, and stuff. And then we would just start. And the guests would be like, what is this? What, <laughs> what is this creature I'm looking at? So we developed a thing and and then it would take there would be like this break-in period with the guests and then eventually they would warm up to net and stuff um so really quickly we were like wow we have to the moment that guest walks in we all have to be at our stations and they will now interact with net net would be like hey welcome to the show sit down you know brian would normally say hey this is ned and ned would you know we would all be there saying hey you know and and they would sort of we would break the ice Mm -hmm. right there and keep Ned alive for the guest um, when the cameras weren't even rolling. And it really helped for the, for all the, the guests to then interact with Ned as this talk show guy. Um, but, but guests rarely took, took it off, but we would sometimes find something funny and we would veer off. And uh, like we, Michael Ostrom and I, uh, for some reason, and I, this was one of the gifts we got, but this is, this is Rula Lenska, who no one knows who Rula Lenska is. Uh, this was made to us by someone in the art department. But when I was a kid and when Michael was a kid, she was, she was for VO5. She did commercials for VO5, Rula Lenska. So Michael and I once thought, wouldn't it be funny if Ned, like, really is infatuated with Rula Lenska? And, um, and we didn't tell anybody. So one day we just sort of, during the show, I forget, it was in the comedy show, and I forget who our guest was, but um, we started talking about Rula Lenska, and I could hear in my ear, like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Michael and I would just go off, and Colleen uh, Smith, as Betty, we would sometimes just be like, okay, we're going to have some fun, fun here. Um, normally, we were the ones that veered it off. <laughs> Much to the chagrin, often of the people, but a lot of that stuff made made it in. So yeah. yeah. Now, how how long does it usually take to to make one of these episodes? Well, we shot them out of order. Yeah. Um, it was always dependent on the guest. So mm -hmm. a guest would come in. Uh, we shot from I believe like uh, September first to December um, because there's a lot of wraparounds too, and then. Um, uh, we were doing all kinds of stuff, but a guest would generally be with us about an hour and a half, uh, I guess, which was then cut down to six minutes. So nice. there's some brilliant, yeah. So there's some great editing on the show. Yeah, and I mean, and again, certainly, like, and I, I don't know if, if you, if you guys thought this. I mean, there, there was quite a buzz. Like Ned really kind of like took, took, took it by storm there. Like, did you guys think when you were creating this that this was going to be the well, hit that it did become? Well, no, I mean, we, you know, and this is sort of the story of the way things, things go. You, you do stuff and you're like, well, gosh, I hope people like that. And sometimes you're really right. And sometimes you're really wrong. Right. So, um, so we, we wrapped filming in December of 2019 and then, um, the show didn't, premiere until September. Now I know COVID had a bunch to do yeah. with, you know, you know, getting stuff stuff done, but it was pretty much as far as the filming, that was in the can. So there was a um we didn't really know, but I know we were like, when is the show gonna air and stuff? And then finally when they chose sep September, uh we were like, yay. And and it's it's been great that people like it because it's um it doesn't take itself too seriously and it's just kind of silly and it's not earth shattering and it's just, it's an alien interviewing humans. And, um, and I'm glad that people like it cause it, it, uh, there is a bit of, um, there is a bit of freakazoid in, in, in its mentality for me anyway, which is just yeah. like, I don't know, let's just do this. Now. I, and I mean, I'll just ask you, this is, this is more of a hence related question. You probably can't answer it. Do you think, cause I know, Disney and everything. Do you think there's a chance Kermit may show up on an episode of Ned in the future? I don't know. I honestly, I, I first of all, I would be the last person to know, but uh, <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. Sure. 
things. I've, I've seen that come up. I'm sure you've seen that. That has come up quite a bit because especially now the Muppet show back, I mean, Disney synergy, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah hey, I mean, it, it, it's certainly within the realm of possibility. I'd, I'd imagine. Um, and we have now I have I have that picture was sent to me. I'm going to share it with that because we do have some we have some more going back to animation and Freakazoid. Um, but I want to share. So th this is one of our watchers here. Um, this is what he wanted to share with you. This is the Freakazoid action figure that he created. So check that out. Oh, very cool. It was done by Matt Casper. That I is awesome. And I think, well, you know, and I, and, you know, he used, um, I think it was like some of those justice league figures. Um, and I guess going into some of the questions here that, cause we got some more things about Freakazoid coming up. Yeah. Um, Freakazoid, when that was, um, developed that really wasn't created so much as the goofy show right because bruce tim did a lot of sketches for that yeah no it was um it was supposed to be sort of batman with some ironic laughs in it um uh very bruce tim very you know dark and moody and cool um and he was developing it for steven because it was it was going to be it was going to lead off the kids WB premiere and it was another collab with Steven. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think, so it probably would have been like an amazing, you know, Batman, -y, dark, cool thing with this kind of odd character. Yeah. Um, and, but I guess Steven in Steven's mind, Steven had more of a like goofy, crazy comedy vibe to it. Um, and I guess that's not Bruce Tim's thing. Yeah. So, and I, I was still working on on Animaniacs, and then Ruger came in one day and said, "You're not working on Animaniacs anymore. You're working on this show called Freakazoid." And I was like, "What's what's what's that?" So there was a lot of development art that uh, Paul Dini, uh, a lot of development writing that Paul Dini had had done. Um, and the problem was, this is like December. Uh, I want to say 1994 Man. and we were going to premiere within eight months wow. which, uh, and Tom was like uh, and it was John McCann and myself and Tom Ruger and uh, I think Alan Burnett was going to do some writing and obviously Paul, Paul Dini but it was like totally reimagined um, and there was no time there was like no time so I think Tom Ruger went uh, home over the Christmas break, and he just wrote stream of conscious weird stuff. Um, and that sort of became Freakazoid. So, you know, just crazy little bits. I think in Tom's mind, Tom wanted to do like a variety superhero show, like a, like starring Fre Freakazoid, but just weird, weird stuff. <laughs> right. um, and um, and I think Stephen, <laughs> we had a meeting with Stephen at Amblin, and um, Stephen was like, that's certainly weird. That's weird. You're not going to be this weird, right? So Tom was like, no, 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 we're not going to be this weird. So I think I think we um, we decided to, to, to pull it back a little bit of that. Although everything Tom wrote in, in there has made it into the, made it into Freakazoid in different forms. There was Handman, mm -hmm. um, all that, all that crazy stuff. Um, weird stuff. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, we had like no time. We knew that, uh, here's what we knew. We knew Freakazoid was a superhero. Um, and, but so here's the thing. Tom, um, John McCann and I, um, we were like, we don't really, I mean, we don't know superhero lore. We don't know any of this stuff. So more to protect ourselves rather than having to figure it out, we decided that Freakazoid, Freakazoid could pretty much do whatever he wanted, um, except fly. And so we would, you know, we would put our hands up and run through the hallway going, uh, and everyone thought we were crazy. Uh, like, what are you doing? And we're just practicing. Um, but... I, and I remember Tom and I, uh, John and I once, we were like, we're trying to figure out how does Dexter become Freakazoid? And we had, you know, we were like, well, geez, we can figure this out. So we figured out that whenever someone does a garage door, he becomes Freakazoid. And I remember we went into Tom Ruby's office and we're like, Tom, we figured it out. And Tom was like, I don't care. We have, we have like months to get this done. Do whatever you want. So then we, we decided it didn't matter. 
So really it was that freedom of nothing mattered. Um, nothing's important, nothing matters. It's ever, it's whatever we say we want it to be on a daily basis. Um, and it became this freeing, cathartic, like whatever we want to do. Um, and <laughs> it was, it was more fun than I've ever had oh. in a, doing a show. The imagination just went wild. And then how did you, you know, so you're working, you're creating it. And then how did all of a sudden they're like, you know, Paul, guess what? You're not the voice. How, like, what was that? What, how did so, that so we were we were writing it just just with a we were just writing weird stuff right and and I think we had written a, a show called uh, John had written Dance of Doom which was our pilot episode I had just written Candle Jack we we John and I sort of heard this voice um, and and they brought everybody in to audition I mean like big names and and no names and all kinds of all kinds of people. And everybody was sort of giving it that Jim Carrey mask sort of thing. And um, rightly so, because we didn't know what to tell them. We would go, I, maybe. And, and we discovered, boy, is there's one thing we don't want is that. Um, because we wanted him to be just kind of normal exactly. and then go off into weird, weirdness. And, and, and we were discovering. We didn't know what to tell an, anybody. So... Um, we were at an audition. I think we had seen everybody and everybody did a great job, but we weren't hearing it. So Tom, I, it's like one of these moments in Hollywood where everybody is like, everyone's despondent and everyone's just sitting around and just sort of going, what are we going to do? And Tom goes, why don't you go in there? And just the, I, the idea was, why don't you go in there? And so we can play this for actors. And I was like, I don't know how this, this goes. So I went in the booth and I just started, uh, I was doing Dance of Doom. I remember I, we just sort of goofed with it. Um, and Tom Ruger, who's like a brilliant human yeah. being, Tom would go, okay, give me, push that, go crazy there, go crazy there. And I don't know what you're going to do here for this part, but do whatever you want and we'll just whatever. And I think we were in there for two hours or something. And I'm screaming and yelling and being silly and doing this and doing that. And Tom, you know, doing Jerry Lewis of all things. And I was like, this. Somebody mentioned that earlier too in here. Yeah. Like, this is terrible. Like, no one will ever, this is, I don't know what, what we're doing. But little, I didn't know that Tom cut all that together in a coherent ep episode. Huh. And there was one other really good actor. Uh, who's like super good, who did a great job and would have been a great freakazoid. And there was mine. And Tom sent them both to Stephen and um, said, Stephen, we're against the gun here. Like, we got to make a choice. So uh, <laughs> so Stephen was like, well, just have Paul do it. So, um, and that's how it went. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, and I guess Matt Casper here just wrote, so it just landed in your lap. The series, yes. the role, everything. Yeah, it did. It did. It did. It did. And, and but 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 see, the lesson there is you never know. You never know what's going to come. Like who's going to open a door? Who's going to say we have this thing? You 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 never like had Freakazoid been a well thought out like this is what it is and this is how it's going to be. I don't think Freakazoid would have been as much fun. Like every script on Freakazoid was a discovery of like, I don't know, let's try this. Um, uh, Freakazoid is the only show I've ever written that it was literally written like, oh, you know, it'd be funny now. Let's do that. Oh, you're going to be funny now. Let's do that. And John McCann, sort of my co-conspirator on this, mm -hmm. uh, he was of the same mind and, and little things that made us laugh, like Paul Harvey, um, yeah. who, you know, nobody Nobody, you know, Paul Harvey was not, trust me, this was not a big, big deal. But Paul Harvey comes from, <laughs> Paul Harvey was a huge um, radio personality yeah. and he did the rest of the story. Um, and so the reason Paul Harvey ended up on Freakazoid was when we won the Peabody Award for Animaniacs, Gene McCurdy flew us all, all the writers um, to the Waldorf Astoria, or I forget where it was, to the ceremony. Mm -hmm. So all the writers are sitting at this table 
we're at the Peabody Awards. And with the Peabody, you already know you, you won, so it's all great. And there's all these, like, Christine Anam Poor is winning and all these people, and Paul Harvey was there, and it was just this, like, what the heck are we doing here? So we were all just feeling no pain. The champagne was flowing, and and I I had been all in the office. I would always do a Paul Harvey Im impression. <laughs> and now you know the rest of the story. So we're all sitting at this table uh, at the Waldorf Astoria, drinking champagne, feeling no pain. And um, Paul Harvey gets up onto the podium oh, no. and starts talking. And we all just start giggling unrelentless. And I start doing Paul Harvey and Gene McCurdy, who, by the way, is the best boss that ever lived and walked the, walked the face of the earth. She is the reason Warner Brothers Animation in the 90s was what it was. Um, she's like, stop it, stop it, don't stop it, you know? And we were, it was like we were in church. Anyway, anyway, from there, that's when Paul Harvey sort of, in our minds, built this weird sort of thing. So when we started, and the other thing Paul Harvey did on Freakazoid was he he was able to wrap things up when we didn't want to have like what the third act was, right? We didn't, because for us, it wasn't about how he stopped the villain. It was like, he, yeah, he stopped the villain. So we would, we would give it to Paul Harvey um, because that's not whatever, what uh, Freakazoid was about. It was never about like the plot and the, this happened and that happened. It was just about having fun. So um, I, in fact, I think about that now, like trying to pitch that to executives now saying, well, we won't, sometimes we'll never like, we'll never find out what happened. And, you know, we would never get away with that today, ever, ever. No, that, that, you know, and that, and you're talking about like today and certainly that, 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 I mean, as we're getting close to the end here, I mean, um, one of the people who wrote here, um, let me just go back to the question. Um, Aaron, he's a, he's a, he has a stumper, and he just he did some casting here. Hypothetical live action freakazoid movie, um, and there's enough shtick. Modern superhero films are ripe for parody. Who would you say play the lead? Could you see there ever? Could Warner's ever be like, hey, you know what? We want to do a live action freakazoid, or? Uh, sure. I mean, when we were uh, when we were making it, I think when we thought we were. <laughs> Before we found out we were we were canceled, you know, we had all kinds of dreams and ambitions about, you know, doing a live action freakazoid. In fact, I remember sitting with Gene McCurdy at a restaurant once think, thinking about about that. Yeah. I don't know who could who could do it. I mean, I'm sure any anybody could. Those two choices that I just saw, those are those are fine. Yeah. yeah. Because and, 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 you know, and, and sitting here just talking about obviously feature film wise, but um. You know, uh, Freakazoid has been back in like the last few months, right? Um, because I'm pulling. Oh up yeah, here. I'm seeing Titan, Titans Go. Yeah, yeah. Like, how did that come about? Like, they just came and said, "Hey, Paul, let's do Freakazoid." <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I, in fact, I was shooting Earth to Ned. I was doing Earth to Ned, and I got a call from Warner Brothers saying, "Hey, uh, one of our guys here, the guys that uh, um, Peter that does um, Teen Titans Go, he's a big fan of Freakazoid, and he wants to." do a little crossover and i was like well you know you better check with steven and uh which they wrote into that um and they were like yes yeah, steven's all in, in into it i was like okay fine so um yeah they wrote it and then they were, they were such nice people they were like can, can we send you the script and you add what they're like well yeah sure i'd love I'd love to they wrote a really tight script but i decided in my own way to like add a few things for freakazoid and um, but the beautiful thing about that was the guy, Peter, anyway, he got it. He knew Freakazoid and, um, I just added a few, few things. Um, and I think, you know, I was originally kind of dreading what it would be like and stuff, but it's almost like a love letter to Fre Freakazoid. I, I, I think it was great. So yeah, yeah, I was really, I was really happy with it. Yeah. And cause, and I also remember hearing rumors, obviously, um, they just, they did, um, the new Animaniacs. Mm -hmm. I heard that there were rumors circulating around that when they were pitching it to Hulu, they were pitching potentially Freakazoid to be a part of that. Did you hear anything about that, or is that just no, a, no, 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 no? But thing? to be honest with you, the way these things work, that could vary, and I don't really know. Um, you know, uh, in the same way, sort of when they were doing Animaniacs and getting it going, they never really talked to Tom Ruger. It's just yeah. it's 
it's just it's just the breaks of the game. So if there was some freakazoid thing happening, uh, chances are I wouldn't know anyway. Until they needed you. Yeah, yeah. Then if if then, you know, you just never know. I mean, um, you never know. And you'd have to just go, okay, well, I guess that's the way that goes. So. Yeah, I mean, and certainly, I guess, and going back to that Teen Titans thing, like they knew if we were doing Freakazoid, we need Paul Rugg. And they brought Ed Asner back. And right. like, yes, yes. Like, they went with the crew. And I mean, going to Animaniacs, like, yes, they didn't bring the, a lot of the creative crew. They don't think they bring any of the creative crew except the voice actors. But, you know, they went with, those people and i mean certainly i hope going forward they do give all the folks that worked on the show originally their due justice because i saw they just announced season three today yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's doing it's doing great so yeah. I, I think that's i think that's awesome uh uh that's just great and it's good for rob and jess and tress and mo um it's 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 great yeah, and I mean, certainly, like I, you know, HBO Max that that's opening up all other doors. I know Batman, Batman the animated series is rumored to be coming back. They're doing a new Tiny Tunes, so you know, who knows? Maybe Freakazoid might be on their laundry list of things to get done as well. You never, never know. <laughs> um. So yeah, no. Again, you know, we've been on for about an hour now. So, and I, th I think you blew everybody away with all that Freakazoid behind the scenes. People did not know. I'm just like looking through the comments. I did not know that. Wow. <laughs> Like wow, and then I mean that's why the show was so great, and it turned out turned out to be absolutely hilarious. So yeah. I mean, you know, no, thank you, thank you again for sharing all these like yes, behind, the, behind the scenes stories, and thanks thanks to everybody who joined us tonight. Um, thank you, everyone. Freakazoid's not streaming anywhere, is it right now either? Uh, no, I think um, maybe you can get it on Amazon Prime. You can get it on Apple TV. Yeah, uh, DVDs, or you can, or you can do that. You can hold those up and hold them to your ears and something happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you can always watch those on DVD. Um, yeah. But yeah, and hope, hopefully maybe they'll get to HBO Max or Boomer yeah. or something like that. But Paul, thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Everybody watching, thank you for um, watching. We'll see you next week on In Credit Chat. Make sure you follow, like, and share us here. Um, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all that good place. And we will see you all really soon. And have a great night, everybody. Bye.